Welcome back to the Revolution in Ideology podcast. I'm Jared. I'm Nick. And today we are going to be talking about the uh, slave revolt of Nat Turner, one of uh, myself and Nick's like favorite historical events. Um, it's a good example of agency, agency against oppression. Of course, that's uh, something that Nick and I both specialize in. Any thoughts before we kind of kick things off? No, I'm excited about this. We've been waiting on this one for a long time. Kind okay. of, We're trying to kind of go in chronological order, so... We finally got here, I guess, is where we're at. Yeah, I mean, we've been wanting to talk about Nat Turner. We've got future episodes coming up on like David Walker and William Grimes as well. But these these individuals that have used their their the abilities around them and and pushed the envelope um, for social justice. Um, and uh, let's just get started. So the first thing I want to kind of kick off with is uh, if you've already explored our channel a little bit, you've seen videos on the transatlantic slave trade. You've seen videos on ideological and scientific racism. So we've already, uh, Nick led a great, uh, great video on um, the invention of whiteness in Virginia. So we've already dabbled quite a bit in race relations in, in the Myth is America series, which this is a part of. What I want to focus on now, though, is is not just looking back at those so that we understand what's transpiring by the time we get to the 1800s, this this life at this point of, at this, well, let's do the math on that. Let's see, 1492 to 1820, what are we nearing, 350 years of oppression already at this point? Yep. Okay, so yeah, 300 years of, again, ideal, material, and practical oppression uh, are already well in place by the time we get to Nat Turner. Um Anyway, most USers are kind of vaguely aware of, of the United States slave-based ba slave past, but most are provided uh, very little detail in how absolutely brutal and dehumanizing and oppressive it actually was, nor are they actually taught about the ideological socialization that systemized, systematized excuse me, an entire way of thinking that uh, clearly is still impacting the country today. Like, that's un I mean, any thoughts on that? I mean, like systemic racism is a thing we hear, but we very rarely like explore its origins, its foundation, foundations, its bedrock and how it, it has evolved over time. So some people might be like, well, slavery is not a thing anymore, but the system at uh, I can't even speak today. <laughs> systemic racism clearly is. So. No, yeah, I think that that's something that's key is that we very oftentimes fail to dissect the history of the origins of systemic racism, how it has continued and evolved over time so that it's still manifested today in our society, which it very clearly is, which is part of the whole reason we wanted to start this series of the podcast was to sort of unearth a lot of that history and make it available to our listeners um, in an easily digestible format. So we also want to talk about not just like oppression and subjugation and these topics that are quote unquote downers, um, especially for uh, people of privilege now that don't want to have to feel any sort of guilt or anything regarding their station now and how that station is related to the past. But equally important is how the numerous acts of defiance, resistance, and rebellion are usually glossed over in either our K through 12 system or uh, among our popular media. So that's another thing that we're trying to um, elicit right now is these ideas that there are different ways to make change. And it's not always just like hand holding and singing Kumbaya. There are other ways to make social change. And sometimes you have to be a little bit more radical uh, for that to take place. So we want to focus on the agency of individuals um, and we talked about this back with our Tecumseh episode, the agency of individuals to actually engage in different ways of making change and not the ways that are popular among a state that seeks to create docile, docile bodies, for lack of a better term. Thoughts on that, Nick? We're going to talk a little Foucault here for a second anyway. But yeah. yeah. No, I think that it's, yeah, that's also a crucial point is that the whitewashed version of black history and the history of other oppressed peoples in the United States is so watered down to right. where we get like the Dr. Kings and we get the Rosa Parks and the, but we don't get like the Nat Turners, uh, like we're about to and talk we don't about. Even or get the real Dr. King. No, we yeah. The, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or like the Tecumsehs, like we talked about last time. Like all of those things are basically glossed over. Uh, the Malcolm X's, like the Fred Hamptons that we could go on and on, which we will. That's the whole point of the series. But, um, yeah, that's all glossed over for like the whitewash sort of nonviolent, um, version of events. Yeah, overlooking these individuals is actually probably more problematic than overlooking just the oppressive brutality of a slave-based economy in this mm -hmm. case. Skipping over examples of historical agency of any kind by slaves, by women, by indigenous peoples, uh, performs four key epistemic functions that I've identified. So I want Nick's thoughts on these because I don't know that he's seen these yet. 
Number one, by not investigating the ways oppressed peoples exerted themselves against the oppression, the narrative essentially assumes that they were relatively okay with the situation or that they merely persevered quietly until the time was right. This absolves the dominant class, storytellers, or progeny thereof of at least some guilt. Thoughts on that first point? 100% agree. And I can't think of a better example of this than the Kanye West I don't even know what to call it, yeah. debacle when he was at TMZ, I think, the offices, and he said, yeah. like, yeah. I'm not even going to remember the exact quote now, paraphrasing, like, black people wanted to be slaves, right? After 400 years, you want to be slaves. Like, just the misinformation and the misinterpretation of events and the just glossing over of all of the, all of the resistance and so many different manifestations, it's just atrocious. Right. Okay, second function. As above, not investigating the, way, investigating the ways oppressed people exert themselves against oppression, the narrative essentially assumes that they were relatively okay with the situation or that they merely persevered quietly until the time was right. This seeks to promote the same reaction for today's people still facing inequality or inequity. In other words, just deal with it. That's just the way it is. And people before had it even worse. Oh my God, how many times we've heard this conversation. Yeah. In classrooms, in, in out in the public sphere, like, oh, at least it, there's no more slavery. It's so much better now. Like, mm -hmm. it's, it's obscene. It completely discounts the oppression that continues to this day. Three, hero generation. Ignoring advocates of change that don't fit a certain discourse, gender, or racial profile allows the dominant class, storyteller, storytellers, or progeny thereof to deconstruct the hero and the villain, and what they look, sound, and act like, both past and present. Thoughts on that? What we, what we view as a real American hero is very rarely a woman, or a person of color, or an indigenous person. It's yeah. always the same dudes we're carving into mountains, or putting on money, or whatever. Yeah, or like the Dr. King example, like, well, he's the hero of, if we're looking at the Malcolm X and Dr. King dichotomy, even though that's ridiculous, because he was the peaceful one. And he, like, it fits this, like you just talked about docile bodies earlier, but it fits the narrative of nonviolence and so on that serves to protect the state, to use Gelder Luce's words. Right, right? Dr. King calls for revolution. Yeah. We always forget, like, the last three years of his life. But anyway, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's for future episodes. Okay, number four, last function. By telling the stories this way, we encourage the idea of the docile body. Modern learners also live in imperfect worlds. Nearly everyone has a bone or two to pick with their society, regardless of their political persuasion, demographic data, etc. Looking past all the way agents of change actually made change in the past and only focusing on easy to control or manipulate strategy promotes a population, and this is from Foucault, Foucault that may be subjected, used, transformed, and improved. And this comes from his work Discipline and Punish. Yeah, as long as we're promoting the narrative of nonviolent change or change that, you know, through voting and so on, that basically is completely ineffective. It makes it really easy to control a population and it Absolutely. creates docile bodies. Absolutely. So we want to talk about agency. And of course, this episode's focused on Nat Turner. And let's talk about what agency is real quick. Agency, and I'm using Wikipedia's definition of, of all definitions, but I actually like it the best, is the capacity, condition, or state of acting or of exerting power. And that's what agency is. And that's what Nat Turner is. He yep. exerts his power. In practice to this point, rebellion, slave organization, slowdowns, using the legislative role of the judicial system, appealing to political leaders, full-blown exit, which we have a video on what exit is, and education. These are all examples of slave-based agency in antebellum America. And Nat Turner kind of represents a little bit of all of these. So let's just dive right into who Nat Turner was. He is a true revolutionary. Uh, he was born in 1800 and, of course, was executed in 1831. He was born a slave in Southampton, Camp Southampton County, Virginia, and he was owned, I hate that word so much, owned by Benjamin Turner, so hence he takes that surname. Um, and he was inherited by Benjamin's son Samuel in 1810. Inherited? Thoughts? Yeah, I, mean, I mean, it just shows, again, gross American past. 100%. We don't typically think of... It's so weird. I struggle with this a lot because we get this like in K through 12, right? That black people were property and they were inherited and handed down and like bought and sold. But we don't get even close, even like no matter how much you study it, I don't think we can scratch the surface of just the atrocity of like what this was like. And we don't really digest what that means. No. We're not digesting like literally inherited. This human being was inherited by another human yeah, being. Yeah, just like a couch or a home or like a, what it's ridiculous. Property, but we don't actually absorb yep. what that means. 
Okay. Totally. Yeah, I mean, all right. He taught himself how to read and write very early on. And these are in his words. And one of the sources we're going to be looking at are the confessions, of course, of Nat Turner, the most famous uh, of our primary sources here. The manner in which I learned to read and write not only had great influence on my own mind as I acquired it with the most perfect ease, so much so that I have no recollection, whatever, of learning the alphabet. That's in Turner's own words. He also began to rebel very early. He says, I was not addicted to stealing in my youth, nor have ever been. Yet such was the confidence of the Negroes in that neighborhood, even at this early period of my life, in my superior judgment, that they would often carry me with them when they were going on any uh, roguery to plan for them. Any thoughts on these like early quotes? These are his reflections on his early life. A, I learned how to read super easily. B, when various things were going on as a youth, I'd be part of them. They, they yeah. brought me with them to help organize. Mm -hmm. Kind of cool. As far as a religious upbringing, bringing, I mean, I put question mark in my own like notes that I would use, you know, whatever, in lecture and things along those lines. What are the ramifications, before we even dig into this, of the Christianization of oppressed peoples, in your opinion? Like, that's one of the biggest things that we look at, and it's one of the biggest things that we've seen that rationalizes the horrific behavior of white people in the past, is that they are Christianizing them, or they are civilizing them. Whether we're talking about Spanish conquistadors literally committing genocide on the Taino, or setting up their missions in St. Augustine or Santa Fe, or we're talking about the transatlantic slave trade, where they're Christianizing these, these uh, various African peoples, like... It, and then here's the thing that I, I think the adoption thereof of that ideology by the oppressed, I guess, is what I'm asking our sociologist here. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it serves two main functions, as I can think of as you're going through that is a it justifies it in the mind of the oppressor, right, that they're doing God's work and they're saving the souls of these people. They're civilizing them. Right. right quote unquote. Um, but also it serves the oppressive function for those that are oppressed because they're adopting the ideologies of their oppressor. And so that further serves like functions to oppress them. I also just want to mention, I think we've talked about this before somewhere in one in of the, the episodes. In the birth of racism, we probably talked yeah. about the curse of Ham and all that yeah. stuff. And yeah. the slave Bibles, right? That right. they were given right. Bibles, yep. but they were edited to remove any kind mention of like any revolution, right? right? To not give them any ideas. Yeah, I mean, this is the role of the ethically constitutive story, of which we also have a video on what an ethically constitutive story is. But in short, these are the stories that inform the way we live. And, and every bit of knowledge that we absorb can be part of an ethically constitutive story. They teach us as individuals within a society what is considered, and again, it's subjective, but what is considered right and wrong. They're constitutive, so they're socially binding, and they're delivered in stories, i.e. entertaining fashion, so that we absorb them. And religion is arguably... Arguably, there's a couple others, but arguably the best at hijacking these ethically constitutive stories or manufacturing them all together to get people to be willing servants. Yeah, or being one itself. Yeah, like, yeah. absolutely. Completely. Um, in his own words, these are now Nat Turner's words, quote, Having soon discovered to be great, I must appear so, and therefore studiously avoided mixing in society and wrapped myself in mystery, devoting my time to fasting and prayer, unquote. Um, so we can see that he was a very religious man. He went on to conduct his own services, his own religious services. He would give religious services. And he becomes known as the, not necessarily by the other slaves, but by the slave owners, the prophet. Now, I want to pause here for just a second. Uh, we just recently, I don't know, a couple weeks ago, did the episode on Tecumseh. And again, that is another example of oppressed people. But then his brother, Tenskwatawa, well, originally Lala Wythika, becomes a prophet as well. What is, again, this? I yep. brought it up last episode, what is this correlation between prophecy and oppression? Yeah, like we said last time, it's like this, <laughs> it depends on where you lie on whether you believe it or not, right? Right. So like from the outsider's perspective that may not believe that they were actually prophets, right? They are utilizing this religious tool in order to motivate the people and their own behaviors, perhaps justify them, etc. If you believe that they are real visions or whatever, which we're about to get to, then somehow you have some faith in God informing these people of the way to liberation. Right. And we've seen this with like the creation of all major religions started with prophecy. They were at one point all like social justice movements. They really were Christianity, Islam, Buddhism. They were all again, they were social justice movements. Yep, they were challenging rebellions. The status they quo. were rebellions at one yeah. point. Some of them became the future oppressor and hegemony, but at one point that's how they started. 
1825, he had begun to have visions. I'm actually going to kind of skip over his first vision, which happened while he was working in the field. Um, his second vision in 1825, um, where it, this is, and I quote, I saw white spirits and black spirits engaged in battle, and the sun was darkened. The thunder rolled, and the blood flowed in streams. And I heard a voice saying, Such is your luck. Such you are called to see, and let it come rough or smooth. You must surely bear it. What do you think? If you want to observe that, like that, that, that first vision he has, this is in his words. What are your thoughts? Like, how can this be used to motivate what we already know is coming? Yeah, um... I mean, the spirits, I think that's what he said. The spirits are tell, giving, telling him, ex kind of prescribing behaviors, right? They're telling him what to do based on his current station in life. Well, and the epic battle, I think, is yeah. important. This idea of an epic battle. Again, Tenskwatawa had the epic battle. Like, this is important. Like, this is inevitable, essentially, mm -hmm. is what he's saying. I mean, it plays into the whole religious narrative of the apocalypse and the second coming and, you know, et cetera. Absolutely. His third vision takes place in 1828, and I quote, I heard a loud noise in the heavens, and the spirit instantly appeared to me and said the serpent was loosened, and Christ had laid down the yoke he had borne for the sins of men, and that I should take it on and fight against the serpent, for the time was fast approaching when the first should be last and the last should be first. My favorite quote right there. Mm -hmm. Thoughts? Yeah, I mean, this is straight up talking about an inversion of the hierarchy. The... It, yeah. But the, the the thing here is that those are the words of, of Jesus of Nazareth himself in the yep. Synoptic Gospels. Exactly. Specifically, I believe the Sermon on the Mount, mm -hmm. uh, Matthew 5 through 7. What we see here is this idea that in this case, the oppressed person, which again, Jesus of Nazareth was speaking for oppressed people all the way back in the day. Right. We see this now translated into the 1800s. The reason I find this so powerful is it's probably easy for slaves that are going to Southern Baptist churches on plantations to relate to this. How do the slave owners themselves rationalize their own horrific behavior, ideals, practices, when they know very well that their purported belief system advocates for, again, the first shall, or the last shall now be first and the first shall now be last? Like, how do they, like, rationalize that? Because I even see that in today's society when we see uh, uh, people advocating against racial oppression or systemic hierarchy or uh, the pitfalls of capitalism. We see these people at top that say they are of a certain faith, but actually act, if we want to be biblical, more like the Romans than they do Christ. Yeah, I mean, I think it's the, it's the malleability of the Christian dogma that even the white Christian billionaire can view himself as the last instead of the first. It's gross. It's like mental wars gymnastics. On Christmas and yeah. Like, it's how does I mean that's yeah I, I just yeah. It, it, it's mind boggling. I mean I've been in personal engagements with this specific discussion recently, so I guess it's just it's a thing. But anyway, let's let's move forward. After these these initial versions, the first three, um, he ends up being sold again. This idea of property. He sold uh, by Joseph Travis in 1830. He was waiting for God's signal because he's already ready. He's ready for a rebellion. He believes in these visions and he believes it is be he is being called to lead this rebellion uh, that will guide us towards this epic battle between black and white spirits. As he's waiting for this si sig signal to, and this is again his words, slay my enemies with their own weapons... I love that quote. Slay mm -hmm. my enemies with their own weapons. A solar eclipse takes place in February 12th of 1831. Again, a solar eclipse, just like we see with like Tecumseh and stuff like that. What are your thoughts? Like, again, these are, these are, these are events. They could be uh, 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 given by God or they could be just be natural events. I suppose it depends on your perspective. Yeah, it's either a but, great coincidence or like yeah, some kind of it, supernatural power. Not right? judging any beliefs in this case, but they are happening. His original plan was to rebel, and he did this intentionally, on the 4th of July. Yep. That was his original plan, but he actually ends up getting sick, so they have to postpone um, the rebellion. It ends up being postponed until August 21st of 1831. Seventy enslaved and free blacks end up going in Southampton County, Virginia, house to house, freeing slaves and killing almost all of the whites they encountered. I want to pause there for just a second. They're, they're not just freeing the slaves. They are killing the whites that are slave owners. Now, um, a lot of people, like, again, that are looking for the peace, love, and hand-holding type of rebellion that, that are, is expected of us today, what are your thoughts on that? 
Yeah, I mean, I mean this is why, about, like, this is why it's glossed over in the history books, right? Because like they go house to house freeing the slaves. You're like, oh, that's nice. And slaying white people and white people are like, whoa. And then we have to modify the story or leave it out or like whatever. But I, Completely denigrate it. Like, yeah. But here's the thing. White people have been killing black people for centuries yeah. at that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like it. I mean, you wouldn't be too far out of line to say like you got what you fucking deserved. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, what do you do? You, you literally enslaved, dehumanized, turn these individuals, these humans into like property, kill, whip, rape sell children, all of these things for three or four hundred years and you lose your mind over a rebellion? Mm -hmm. It was coming. Yeah, what did you think was going to happen? Right? I mean, these are the same people that brag about eyes for an eye and so on and so forth. Like, it's it's absolutely, the hypocrisy is kind of stunning in certain ways. Okay, anyway, how did they kill them? Silent weapons. A, it was tough to get their hands on guns, but even if they could, guns are not a good way to, like, rebel at least not in the 1800s yeah especially back then you're loading like yeah yeah. so they use silent weapons um and so those silent weapons were like knives hatchets axes blunt tools just beating people over the head yeah. yeah hammers and stuff like that they also and this is where people get even more squeamish did not discriminate based on age or sex do you think that's controversial nick oh 100 now it is yeah people but do you lose think it was minds. controversial for them it's tough. Like we talked about in the Tecumseh episode, like you don't care if they're settlers or they're men or they're women, they're all white monsters. Yeah. Did the white women or white children care to discriminate age or sex when it came to slave children? No. Or women? I mean, I, some of them I'm sure did. I don't want to say a blanket no, but like, as like, no. Blacks were blacks and they were animals and they were property and they were beaten and. Yeah. Turner himself only actually admitted to killing one person himself. And that was a woman named Margaret Whitehead, who he beat with like a fence post. Um, he does admit it. He, he does admit to killing her. Um, but that means that all of the rest of the whites uh, that end up dead, it's going to be close to like 60, um, were beaten or killed by other slaves. Now, here's an interesting piece. These are like the slave owning class, like the plantation owning class. Turner and his slaves actually, in their rebellion, spared most of the poor whites. Mm -hmm. Why do you think they would spare the poor whites? An argument can be made that the poor whites have just much in common with the enslaved blacks, like we talked about in the Invention of Whiteness episode. In the study, Children of Darkness, and this is not a Turner quote, this is from Oates, the author, he says, Turner believed that the poor white inhabitants thought no better of themselves than they did of the Negroes, and that's why Turner spared them. Um, And we're 200 years now removed from when white and black have been, like, separated in Virginia. Again, we did a whole episode on the invention of whiteness. White and black have been separated or segregated based on the whims of the Virginia House of Burgesses and the legislation they've passed. But yet still Turner sees more in common with them. And so basically these slaves uh, uh, let them live. An estimated 60 white people die. 150 to 200 infantry, like the military, shows up with three companies of artillery to end the rebellion. This should sound very familiar, um, not to necessarily date this episode, but the immediate state response is to send in the military to back the oppressive state. Again, any time a military is sent in to put down a rebellion, whether we're talking about, I don't even know, the Kent State massacres in Ohio or wherever, or the COINTELPRO with the FBI um, infiltrating with Dr. King and the Black Panthers and the National Organization for Women, these militant, and these are militant operations, show that it is the state that has the monopoly on violence, not the oppressed. Thoughts? And it's always, like, completely... I don't know if it's over the top, but like here they send in what, two to 300 infantry to, yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. We talked about bacon. Three companies of artillery. Yeah. And we're like cannons. Right. Yeah. For people with like hatchets and hammers and like, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. The white backlash actually makes it even worse. And when I say white backlash, this is all, of course, the racists of Virginia now have an excuse to exert their frustrations upon their own slaves. So racism becomes even more ramped up. 56 blacks that were not even a part of the rebellion were executed right away. 
for merely being sympathizers. I, I don't know how they rationalize this. There's obviously, we could probably dig deeper into the annals. I didn't for this episode because I wanted it to be kind of quicker than some of our other episodes. But they were executed. 56 blacks were executed. Um, the militias that were formed by citizens go on to kill 100 more like in the streets, when I say me in the streets, the streets aren't the way they were back then. So we're talking like dirt roads and like forests and stuff, but they go, these militias go on hunts, kill 100 more, both slaved and free blacks. And as many as another 120 that are proven to not be involved in the rebellion whatsoever. So at this point, we've got uh, a couple of hundred dead. Whether they were part of the rebellion or not, again, they kind of ramp up the violence. So yes, 60 white people did die. So be it. We can, again, go back and forth whether that was justified or not, or a proper form of rebellion. It probably was. Like, again, power never cedes power willingly. Um, anyway, but then the oppressor always has to make it much worse or harsher, again, setting an example or making sure rebellions don't happen again, whatever, however they rationalize this, it's never actually an eye for an eye. They take both eyes. Oh, yeah, much, much further uh, than the rebellion ever went, right? I mean, it just creates, I mean, it creates an open season on blacks as far as the whites are concerned. They're racist Virginians, and they just go out and slaughter. To justify it further, a propaganda campaign is performed both like in print media and like through like word of mouth. It's kind of like a great fear, almost like what happened during the French Revolution, for those of you that know a little bit about the French mm -hmm. Revolution, where the wealthy spread this great fear against the rising up, especially in the rural areas, rural areas of like the peasants. Um, but it's very similar here. A great fear is spread, thus justifying more outlandish behavior by the slave owning class. This great fear spreads to Alabama, North Carolina, and South Carolina, as all of them report rumors of slave armies like marching through the countryside just destroying property property is something that gets people all fired up as well again right. as of like the modern day that's one of the first things like all media look at or all white people look at when they see people of color uh protesting in the streets is oh my god that poor target oh my god that poor cvs pharmacy oh my god the poor small business owner like are you kidding me like you we care more about the property than the lives of human beings yep and that's not new nope the reason we're doing myth is america is to show that's always been the case I mean, even the French Revolution, you just mentioned the Great Fear. That's exactly what they did. They would go to the estate, the manors, and burn them down and, you know. Absolutely, because these are not just like places that people own or whatever their property owns and this is how they make a living. These are literal symbols of the oppressive system itself. And I think that is lost on so many white people. So if you're a slave, your entire life is working the fields. You're going to go seize that property as a symbolic move of taking control and rebellion. Right. If you're black in Minneapolis, you're going to loot and destroy the target because that's a symbol of your oppression. It's not your community, right? It's yeah. the symbol of capitalism the and oppression perform and some sort of like crucial service yeah. to you. It charges you money or makes you work there for wages that are not equitable in comparison to, of course, your peers or other cohorts around you. Like, I, I don't understand how this is lost on so many people. I mean, it's but, the same mental gymnastics that white people have been doing since anyway, this time, clearly. Yeah, we've got to keep moving here. Here's a quote from Richmond Whig, a, a, a white person at the time, 1831. He says, The slaughter of many blacks without trial and under circumstance of great barbarity. So he says that, and that quote is important because, again, he uses this term without trial, which is very interesting. Um, Whig himself, we don't necessarily know, can fully flesh out all of his political like leanings or thoughts on this. But the fact that it was without trial, I think, is important, that he leaves that in there. And it might hint to he sees this as somewhat unjust. Yeah, I agree. Um, and of course, from the Reverend Powell in the New York Evening Post at the time, and here's a quote, it says, many Negroes are killed every day. The exact number will never be known. So the figures I throw out here are kind of rough estimates because again, these, these were people that were uh, enslaved persons and that not necessarily, um, wanting to admit all of this loss of life. You can really quickly in the 1800s change, like again, the demographic, mm -hmm. uh, data of the time period. So Reverend Powell here is saying there's so many are dead that we don't we may never know how many have been killed. Well, and he's like the way he frames it is important, I think, because he said so many blacks die daily, are murdered daily, that we don't even know what the real number is. Absolutely. And this is in the New York Evening Post. So this is obviously up in New York, uh, mm -hmm. uh, where they're kind of like getting news of this secondhand. Militias, and this is key. I want to start a stop here. I wanna just just listen. White militias 
after they would kill the blacks, looted their bodies for money and jewelry. Let me repeat that. The white militias of Virginia, Alabama, South Carolina, uh, and North Carolina would kill blacks and loot their dead bodies for money and jewelry. I mean, it just goes to the framing of looting and who's doing the looting and when is it good looting and bad looting and is it, right, like, ridiculous? Yeah, I mean, we have written evidence of this definitely happening in North Carolina. Another thing that the white militias really liked doing was beheading these dead bodies. They would take, of course, their heads. Um, this comes from the Murfreesboro, Murfreesboro Historical Association. Their severed heads were mounted on poles at crossroads as a grisly form of intimidation. So they would cut off their heads, place them on stakes uh, at crossroads to intimidate. This is not new. We know that they were actually doing this to indigenous people. In fact, the second Thanksgiving in American history took place around the severed head of King Philip, or Medicom was his Native American name. So this is like an American hallmark. Let's just cut people's heads off and, and use that to like celebrate um, the victory of the oppressor or the oppressing class. What do you think? Yeah, it's like you said, a huge factor in intimidation. So that all of the other blacks would see these and they right. might think twice about rebelling, right? But it's such like, yeah, it's a complete like violation of the black body. One of the examples I found, and this this one needs to be fleshed out a little bit more. I'm trying to remember where I found it. But Virginia State Route 658, which is a route today, remains colloquially known as the Blackhead Signpost Road. Like by, by, by like locals. It's not officially named that by the state to the best of my knowledge, mm -hmm. but like, that's what they call it dating back to this time period, black head signpost road to this day. <laughs> Ridiculous. Whites go on to kill 200 more people in the neighboring states, at least. Again, that earlier quote said, we may never know the act by Reverend Powell. May, we may never know the actual number, but at least 200 more. And this is the key with zero legal ramification. Zero legal ramification. Again, so none familiar. of these black people are getting trials, first off. And then none of the whites that are murdering these hundreds of black people are facing any kind of consequence. Which is interesting because if the white people believe they are property, right? Like th there should be at least ramifications for de destroying the property. property. Yeah. yeah, exactly. We, oh, my God. The hypocrisy of, of, of the people during this era and to this day is, is, is mind numbing. Here's what the Virginia legislature decided. They created what is, to, to try, in reaction, they created what is known as the Colonization Bill. And we'll spend more time talking. We already talked a little bit about it in like a prior episode on rugged individualism and on Liberia and James Monroe, etc. But they created the Colonization Bill, which basically state that if you're a free black, you have to be removed from the state of Virginia. And, of course, they created the Police Bill, which denied free blacks trial by jury. So free blacks would technically be like, again, they're, they're not slaves, so they deserve to have these same similar rights as their white counterparts. But the Police Bill in Virginia sets up separate rules for black people which again, Nick has already given us an entire history that this is not new for Virginia, mm -hmm. sets up separate rules for black people so that, again, it's inequitable. They don't even get a trial by jury. Does that sound familiar as of like the 21st century? Yeah, that, that, weird. That the two races are playing by different rules? Strange. Um. Okay. Um, further, further perpetuation of systemic racism leads to inequality in the legal system. Different rules, no justice, and the police literally exist. That's what that bill dictates. The policing in Virginia literally exists to oppress free blacks and slaves. As Childish Gambino says, this is America. Yep. I want to stress that again. The police of Virginia were not just invented, as Nick told us in a prior episode, the invention of whiteness, to police runaway slaves. As of the 1800s, they now exist to exert oppression so that they never rise up with any sort of agency again. And if they do, they do not get equal representation in the legal system. So we're talking Clearly. about the foundation of systemic racism here. And that's what this is about. So when people talk systemic racism in their Twitter or their Facebook or their Insta or whatever they're using to talk about it, and the it's falling on deaf ears by their friends or family that are more whatever of a different political persuasion, it's because they don't understand these are the found this is the bedrock. These are the bedrock. I mean that's the very the definition of systemic racism, which Absolutely. I think people don't understand. Like whether we're talking about like in modern terms, it's like oh the mortgage industry or oh like the police like. Yep. But this has always been the case. It's systemic. It's been like this from the jump. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. In the mortgage industry, policing literally was founded to oppress black people and murder them. At like, least in Virginia. I mean, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we yeah. go back to like the British. Or whatever. Well, right. Yeah. But people forget about this. They don't yeah. understand like from the beginning, it's been like this. Racism has been embedded in these institutions. Nat Turner himself would end up uh, uh, initially able to, to run. He's able to, to live on the run for about a month, month and a half. Um, a white man named Benjamin Phipps ends up finding him. Um, and now I want to talk a little bit about like his confessions. So con- the confessions of Nat Turner is like an actual like record um, of, of what Turner told uh uh, a lawyer. It's also a novel that came out in like the, the 20th century that kind of like dramatizes a little bit. So there's like two confessions. You can either look at the primary source. The novel is really good. It won a bunch of prizes, but it's it's a novel. So there are certain historical liberties that are taken there. So we, But we're going to talk about the, the confessions of Nat Turner as kind of like relayed uh, to, uh, to legal counsel. Now, the context of the confessions is actually kind of important, and I didn't realize this when I kind of started this episode or even when I've taught this before, but even getting these confessions out of Turner was actually paramount for state goals. You see, we've already done an episode where we gave a little bit of credit to the uh, the slave revolt of Gabriel Proctor, and Gabriel... Um, they tried to get confessions out of him to try and figure out like what, how, why he organized this great slave revolt. And Gabriel refused to give any confessions. And Gabriel's revolt was not too far removed from Nat Turner's. So the fact that Nat Turner, perhaps knowing of Gabriel's revolt, um, opted to give confessions is kind of key. Um, again, James Monroe himself, the president of the United States, actually I think it was governor at that time, but regardless, tried to get this confession out of Gabriel during his slave revolt and never did. So these ideas of, in fact, why do you think the state wants these confessions? What's the goal here of the state getting these confessions out of these rebels? They want to know their motivations and know why they were doing this so that they can try to stop it, prevent it from happening in the future. I mean, they want to serve themselves very clearly. So um, Turner himself meets with the lawyer, um, his name is Gray, on November 1st of 1831. And he used this revelations as evidence, um, his, or excuse me, his revelations as evidence at the trial. Um, the lawyer is, the, let me be more clear. The lawyer wasn't just doing this for legal purposes. They, like what he got out of Nat Turner was eventually used um, at the trial um, as evidence, but he also actually was doing this for profit. He knew that he could sell these confessions, which he did. Mm-hmm. He immediately, immediately sought copyright. As soon as he wrote them, he got copyright and started selling them. What do you think of our lawyer here? Oh, what happens when law and money come together? Yeah. Oh, awesome things, obviously. Yeah. He's, I mean, it's a great place for ethics, right? He's clearly an opportunist. Right. Yeah. Like there's no conflict of interest of introducing like money into a legal system, right. is there? Weird. That's why most other more equitable legal systems in the world don't have like paid counsels and things along those lines. But never mind that. We like to, of course, celebrate Western law as like the hallmark of everything. But no, it's not. Like, no. again, money, ambulance chasing, whatever. Moving on. Okay. Um, he went to the extent to prove the veracity of these accounts because he wanted to profit from them, not because he cared. He already knew what right. was going to happen to Nat Turner. We all know what was going to happen to Nat Turner. He's not trying to prove his guilt. He wanted to prove the veracity so that he could ensure that he made the most profit possible. So he got court-certified sworn statements about the authenticity of Nat Turner's statements um, and Turner's willingness to give these confessions. So if you got a copy of the confessions of Nat Turner back in the day, back in the 1830s, it had like all of these like testimonials from like court documents and stuff to prove that they were real, just so that he could make Make sure that he got the most profit out of it. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. Anyway, Gray, again, our lawyer, did depict, depict Nat Turner as exceptional. In Gray's words, again, the lawyer, he is a natural, he has a natural intelligence and quickness of apprehension. It is surpassed by few men that I have seen. But he also said Nat Turner was crazy. He also said he is a complete fanatic or at least plays his part most admirably. So he's like a mad scientist or mm-hmm. like what, what's Gray trying to say about Nat Turner here? Yeah, pretty much. I think it's weird to think about the relationship between mental stability and like rebellion and revolution and how these two things have played together throughout history and how we can discredit certain people throughout history or at least the attempts are made that like oh well they were just crazy right absolutely nat turner um ends up uh on trial officially on november 5th so he gave his testimonial a few days earlier and these are the official like 
charges. He is charged with conspiring to rebel and making insurrection. Of course, we know he was convicted and sentenced to death. Um, and his response was Christ not crucified. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it goes back to like, kind of like that religious discussion. Turner ends up and he's executed by being hanged or hung. Um, he is then beheaded, which of course is an American tradition. Um, he is then drawn and quartered though. What's that mean? Oh, he's like pulled apart. Yeah, yeah, he's like pulled apart. And um, this all takes place on November 11th in the very fitting city of Jerusalem, Virginia. Um, the Virginia General Assembly then said, like they passed more legislation, which like to kind of like combine them all together, made it unlawful to teach reading or writing to slaves or free blacks. So if you were a free black or a slave and you were caught teaching others to read or if you happen to be a, like a nice white person you were teaching slaves or free blacks to read or write that is illegal now in virginia after the rebellion of nat turner they restricted all blacks from holding religious meetings without white oversight so they couldn't have like their own churches a white person or a white minister had to be there or a priest had to be there and they criminalized any possession of abolitionist publications, which comes into play in a future episode we're going to talk about, because concurrently to what we're talking about here, the abolitionist movement is also taking place. So it's not just about rebellion of Nat Turner, like literally concurrently, William Lloyd Garrison, David Walker, these individuals, Frederick Douglass, these individuals are also leading an abolitionist movement. So even holding anything those gentlemen published was illegal in Virginia. Again, keep in mind, of the First Amendment, again, is the ink even dry yet? Thoughts? Yeah. I mean, like we've talked about throughout the series, how quick the First Amendment becomes thrown by the wayside when it serves the state. So, I mean, that kind of wraps up Nat Turner. There's definitely more depth here, but in that case, I explore, uh, I, or I explore, I encourage listeners to explore um, um, even better and more in-depth um, um sources on this topic i mean there's that weird documentary that some of you might be able to find on like youtube it's called like nat turner a most troublesome property i think it's by pbs um there's also of course the recent big budget um hollywood movie about nat turner that also was released a few years back so there are a bunch of wonderful sources on nat turner or you can just flat out read the confessions of nat turner um and i i, I highly recommend these sources on nat turner but as we kind of wind down this episode, again, this one was meant to be a little bit shorter because we want to do some feature bios here. I want Nick's thoughts on like the legacy. What is the legacy of Nat Turner? So we're talking about agency. We kick this off by talking about making social change and he's a revolutionary and listeners might be like, but he died. He killed people, then he died and he was hung. But there's legacy there still. Even if he didn't live to see the changes that perhaps he was making, most revolutionaries don't. Jesus died without seeing, like, the spread of Christianity. Buddha died without seeing, of course, the spread of Buddhism. Um, um, Malcolm X and Dr. King died without seeing the realization of civil rights. And as that comes out of my mouth, we have not yet still seen the, the, the equity of civil rights, which is really depressing. But moving on, you get the idea. Like, the revolutionaries very rarely get to vi visualize or see or live through their revolution. What's his legacy, Nick? I, mean, I think his legacy is... Uh, an example, I mean, it's a revolutionary hero, someone that was willing to, by any means necessary, try to fight against the injustice that was the slave system in the United States at the time. Um, and I think that, like we talked about at the beginning a little bit, he's not taught to the extent that he should be in our K-12 through education system, probably even at the higher education system, because he's an example uh if someone is willing to murder whites and plan a rebellion like this then it sort of is an example of how atrocious it must have been unless he can be discounted as like some zealot or some he's insane or like whatever like right? the lawyer tried to discount. yeah exactly but here's the thing that, that i i highly I, I need people to understand that like what are people to do when they're engaged in this systemic racism and in this case, an institution of slavery? What are they to do? I suppose that's what I would ask the 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 more conservative or even like kind of closet. I don't know, whatever, like the, 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 the white listeners out there that are like, well, he should have used nonviolence. Like, what do you do? When yeah, even liberals, right? Like, what, what do yeah. you do when you're a slave? Like, are they supposed to just like passively endure until they're dead? Like, right. is that like, I guess, is that what their expectation is? Mm hmm. 
Absolutely not. Right. Like, absolutely not. No one would... I wouldn't expect anyone to, like, live without a rebellion. We look at, like, the rebellions of, like, white slave revolts, like Spartacus, which is, like, everybody's freaking hero. We make entire HBO specials about this guy. And he... Absolute violence for that slave revolt. <laughs> right. And he's a hero, right? Mm-hmm. He's a freaking hero. I mean, just like we started the whole series with, like, the American, quote-unquote, revolution, right? They had the highest standard of living of, in of any British colony in the entire empire, but we celebrate that revolt till no end. But and when, it was wildly violent. It was a literal yes, war. Yes. But like if blacks somehow use violence to revolt against the m- most oppressive system in y- American history, like, oh my God, that's going too far. So this is the ethical hypocrisy that Myth is America is trying to draw out. The ethical hypocrisy of our ethically constitutive story. That's all I have for the Nat Turner episode. Nick, take us home. Cool. Check us out online, revolutionandideology.com. If you're not watching this on YouTube, you can subscribe to us there. Uh, Just search Revolution and Ideology and we'll come up. Um, If you're listening to this, know that we have started to do video for some of our episodes. This is one of them. So if you want to see the video, I mean, it gets kind of too late because you listened to the whole thing already, but you can go on YouTube and actually see our faces if you really want to look at uh, two old white guys talking about history. Uh, You can do that there. Uh, Subscribe to our channel on YouTube. If you really like what we're doing, just share what we do, whether it's on YouTube or our website or the podcast itself with your friends. And if you really, really like what we're doing, you can support us on Patreon, give us some of your hard earned dollars. And that helps us to spend a little bit more time uh, growing our listener base and putting out some content. So yeah, I'm Nick. I'm Jared. Until next time. Later.